Well, it's my great privilege to welcome to the pulpit Willie Jolly. Willie is one of the most sought-after uh, speakers in the world today. And in fact, he's in town tomorrow to speak at the Anaheim Convention Center to thousands and thousands of people. And we were able to get him to come here and speak for free, which is amazing. Actually, uh, you know, this is a, it's a real gift, and we're so... Really, though, we're, we're truly blessed, Willie, that you'd be willing to come and give us this gift. And thank you for coming. Willie, God loves you, and so do I. Welcome to the Crystal Cathedral. Thank you. Well, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give account. If I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but an eternity is in it. Good morning, Crystal Cathedral. I'm honored to be here. I'm excited about being here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. You know, I have not been here in about 10 years. The last time I was here, oh, over 10 years ago, I was here as part of a tour that the Crystal Cathedral was putting on for men. And it was a men's conference, and I was part of this tour. And then, as a result of that, we went on a national tour to other places, and I got to meet some of the greatest speakers and ministers as part of this Crystal Cathedral men's tour. So I'm so grateful. I was promoting my book, It Only Takes a Minute to Change Your Life at that time, and having a great time. But I am excited about being here today, and I'm excited about being here this morning, and I'm grateful. Many people know me as a motivational speaker, and I speak around the world, but I also am a licensed minister, and I guess that makes me a motivational minister, huh? <laughs> but I'm excited about the opportunity to talk to you today about comebacks, about comebacks. A setback is a setup for a comeback. I wrote a book some years ago called A Setback is Setup for a Comeback that literally taken me around the world. But I believe that the greatest comeback book that was ever written is the Holy Bible. God is the author and the orchestrator of comebacks. You can see it throughout the Bible. First, you see it in the story of Job, how Job lost everything. And God gave him an incredible comeback and gave him double for his trouble. Or how about Joseph? Joseph had a series of setbacks. He went from the pit to the prison, but then he had a comeback and went to the palace. God had one story after another, and of course, the greatest comeback story of all times, about a carpenter from Galilee who was put up on trumped up charges, convicted of those charges. And he was put on a cross, confirmed dead on that cross, laid in a borrowed grave, and many thought that would be the end of the story. But beloved, 2,000 years have come and gone, and all the navies that ever sailed, and all the armies that ever marched, and all the kings and queens and monarchies that have ever sat have not had the impact on this world as that comeback king. We call him Jesus, and he is the king of comeback. Am I right? So today I want to talk to you for a few minutes about turning setbacks into comebacks. Because a setback really is nothing but a setup for a comeback. See, when I wrote this book, before I could write this book, I had to live this book. 25 years ago, I didn't know there was a speaking industry. 25 years ago, I was a nightclub singer, singing in small, dank, dark, smoke-filled nightclubs, singing songs I hated. But I kept on singing them because they kept on paying me. <laughs> One song I hated, Feelings, I hated that song. <laughs> but every night, the club, I would say, sing Feelings. And I'd sing it loud and strong because I was waiting for somebody to discover me, not knowing most of the people too drunk to discover their way out the front door. <laughs> Well, one night I came in the club. The club owner said, we made a change. We love your band. You've got a lot of fans. But we found something cheaper that was filling up nightclubs. We bought a karaoke machine. I said, but what about my bills? I learned that night, nobody care about your bills, but you and the people you owe. Am I right about it? 
I went home and told my bride. Oh, by the way, when I mention my bride, I always have to take a moment to stop. Because, see, we are newlyweds. Y'all supposed to clap. That's her right up in the front row. Right there, the African American with the blonde hair. That's her. That's her. Yeah, see, uh, see, a couple weeks from now, we're newlyweds. A couple weeks from now, we'll celebrate 27 years of marriage. Now, now, people always ask me, how do you say you're newlyweds? Because I still got the fire for her. That's how. I would crawl over broken glass to get to that woman. I told her one day, I said, if you leave me, I'm coming with you. <laughs> anyway, I told my bride, I said, we got to do something different. And I took a job with the Washington, D.C. public school system as a drug prevention coordinator, talking to little kids about staying away from drugs. And I discovered an ability I didn't know I had to use words to communicate. From the little kids, the teachers would invite me to their teachers' association. And then someone there would invite me to their church. And someone in the church would invite me to their company. And then it started to grow. And then Les Brown, the great motivational speaker, heard me speak and invited me to be on tour with him and Gladys Knight called the Music and Motivation Tour. And that allowed me to meet people in the media. And I got a little radio show. And it got syndicated. And then it went to television. And then to Sirius XM Radio, where you can hear me now every week. And that led to more and more opportunities. And one day, a book publisher called and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, no, I never thought about it. He said, let me make you an offer. I said, I just thought about it. <laughs> the first book came out, and it became a bestseller. And then the second book became a bestseller. And then other books, and then television and radio, and all sorts of things started happening. And one day, I'm speaking in... Dallas, Texas, and my phone is going crazy, and I call my office, and they say, Toastmasters International is trying to reach you. They say it's urgent. I'm not a member of Toastmasters. What do they want? I call Toastmasters. They say, Mr. Jolly, we've been awaiting your call. We just want to let you know you've just been named one of the outstanding five speakers in the world for this year. Former winners include Colin Powell. Thank you. Former winners include Colin Powell, Norman Schwarzkopf, Nelson Mandela, Margaret Thatcher, Christopher Reeve. I said, what? Are you sure you got the right person? Those are big dogs. I'm a little dog. They said something I'll never forget. They said, a little dog keep yapping loud enough and strong enough. Big dogs start to hear about you. <laughs> Moral of the story, just think if I'd never gotten fired and replaced by a karaoke machine. <laughs> just think if I'd never had a setback. Folks, a setback is nothing but a setup for a comeback. <laughs> now, when I wrote the book, I interviewed people. Some of them were celebrities. I got stories about Tina Turner, Lee I. Coker, John Travolta, Les Brown, Wally Famous Amy's, but they were famous. What about us? Everyday, workaday world people. The ones I interviewed like us were the ones that changed my life. Like the young man I interviewed had a small business, two small children, had a setback, went bankrupt, lost his house, lost his car, ended up living on the street. Many thought that would be the end of his story, but he came back and built a company called Daymark, one of the biggest merchandising companies in the country, $240 million a year company. Or how about the ninth grade math teacher I interviewed, Mrs. Doris DeBow, who was told one day when she went to the doctor that she had terminal breast cancer. She was given six months to live. She said, I can't die now. I got too much to do. They said, we're sorry, but you got six months. She sat there for a minute, gathering her thoughts. Then she stood back up, looked the doctors in their eye, and said, I just made up my mind I'm not going to die. She said, I will live for 25 more years. They said, ma'am, we're sorry. The tests are conclusive. You got six months. They sent her home to die. Well, I'm excited to say that lady lived for 33 more years. When I interviewed her, she said, tell the people in your book that I might have cancer, but cancer does not have me. She said, one other thing, and you write it like I said. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, tell them that doctors can give you the diagnosis, but God gives you the prognosis. Or how about the lady going up the corporate ladder, got almost up to the top of the corporate ladder, got almost up to the top, and they fired her, told her she was too old. But she came back and bought the company. <laughs> You're going to have setbacks in this thing called life. 
But when you go through a setback, let me tell you, there are four simple steps that you can employ to turn your setback into a comeback. Step number one, you got to have a vision. Vision. Scripture says without a vision of people perish. But where the vision of people will flourish, you've got to have a vision in your life. Michael Jordan was asked what was the secret to his success as a basketball player. His answer was when he was in high school, he got cut from the basketball team for not being good enough. He went home and started dreaming about doing impossible things with the basketball because he wanted to prove to the coach that the coach had made a mistake. Once he saw it in here, he tried it out on the court, and once he tried it, he realized he could do it. Walt Disney, who saw this area of Orange County, California, was not just an area of orange groves, but could be an amusement park. He went through all sorts of setbacks, bankruptcies, nervous breakdowns, but he didn't give up, and he turned that setback into Disneyland, one of the greatest attractions in the world. Folks, I love the story when Disney World was being opened. It had been a few years since Walt had died, and it was actually in construction when he died. And someone came up to his brother Roy and said, isn't it sad that Walt didn't see this? His brother said, sad? Oh, no. He said, because Walt saw it, that's why it's here today. You must have vision to turn your setbacks into comebacks. Second, you must make some tough decisions. Now, you've got to take some tough decisions. Two are critical. Decision number one, you've got to make a decision to stop hanging around with negative, small-minded, itty-bitty, petty-thinking people. Don't hang around with them. And unfortunately, some of them are going to be in your inner circle. They love you, and they're not trying to be mean-spirited. They just happen to suffer from possibility blindness. They think it's not possible. I know about inner circle friends. When I was in junior high school, I used to play trumpet with a band. My parents said, why aren't you singing with the band? You sing at home, you sing at school. You should sing. Really? Yes. So I went to band practice and said, guys, can I sing tonight? They said, yeah, go ahead and sing. And I started singing, and everybody said it sounded good except one guy who I thought was my best friend. He was the lead singer. He started laughing, and the mob mentality took over, and everybody else started laughing. I felt about this big. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't let my buddy see me cry. So I walked over in the corner and said, I'll never sing again as long as I live. And for three years, I kept that vow. I didn't sing at home, at school, at church. I would not even sing at people's birthday parties when everybody sang happy birthday, because I was ashamed. Three years went by, and one night I'm playing my trumpet in a little dance, and, and, and the band leader gets a note, singer sick, looked around and said, somebody got to sing. He said, Willie, come on over and sing. I said, no, I can't sing. He said, I want you to sing. I said, no, I'm not singing for you or anybody else. He said, you either sing or you fire. Feelings. <laughs> At that point, it became an easy choice, and I started singing, and people stopped dancing and started looking, and I sang, and they clapped. End of the night, people lined up here, lined up there, lined up over here, asking could I sing at their wedding, at their graduation, at the reception, at this and that. Finally hit me like a ton of bricks. My friend had lied to me. <laughs> Don't listen to negative people. They will kill your dream. Also, se second decision is you got to decide, is this a setback period or a setback comma? When I was in elementary school, they told us there were two punctuation marks you needed to know to be able to effectively read and write. One was a period, which meant end of the sentence. My friends in Australia call it a full stop. Or the other one was a comma, pause. So you have a setback in your life. You've got to make a decision. Is this a setback, period, full stop, end of the story, or a setback, comma, pause, transition, more to the story? You've got to make that decision, and how you decide will impact how you will come back. Vision, decision. The third one is action. A vision without an action is an illusion. An action without a vision is mere confusion. But a vision and action put together can give your life a transfusion. You must take action. Scripture says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be opened un unto you. Notice it says, if you take this action, you'll get this blessing. Most people receive not because they ask not, they seek not, they knock not, and then they wonder, why not? <laughs> you must take action. Faith without works is dead. God gives you life. 
See, God's gift to us is life. Our gift to God is what we do with our lives. I say take massive action. Do great and incredible things. Vision, decision, action, and last part is desire. How bad do you want to make this happen? Well, I say you got to want it bad. God said he'll give you the desires of your heart, but you've got to want it bad to turn your setbacks into comebacks. Imagine if you would, one person wakes up around midnight, says, I want a soda. I want it bad. They walk to the refrigerator, no sodas. Walk to the window, open the shades, it's snowing. They go back and check in the refrigerator one more time. Still no sodas. They set up for a glass of water and go back to bed because they really didn't want that soda that bad. Second person wakes up around midnight, he says, I want a soda. Goes to the refrigerator, no sodas. Walk to the window, open the shades. It's snowing. They put on a hat and coat and gloves, galoshes, walk a quarter mile to the corner store, but it's closed. They go back home and they set up for a glass of orange juice. Go back to bed because they really didn't want that soda that bad. Third person wakes up around midnight, says, I want a soda. Walk to the refrigerator, no sodas. Walk to the window, open the shades, it's snowing. Put on a hat and coat, gloves, galoshes, walk a quarter mile to the corner store, it's closed. Another half a mile to the grocery store, it's closed. Another mile to the gas station, but it's sold out. But that person keeps walking and trying until they get a soda. And if you go that far for a soda, how much further would you go for your dreams? That's a question only you can answer. But when you answer that question, it will change your life. You got to have faith. And you got to believe that great things are in your future to turn your setbacks into comebacks. I was a new speaker, had no books, no tapes, no radio, no television, had no credentials to be a speaker. Struggling to keep the lights on, the phones on. Struggling. Finally, somebody calls and said, We want you to come speak in Orlando, Florida. I go to Orlando, I speak. They, they give me a standing ovation and then they give me a check. I was ecstatic. I finally got paid. I went to the airport to fly back home. On the flight home, I pulled that check out a second time, and when I looked at it a second time, I got depressed because that money was already allocated. Anybody ever got your check, and by the time you get home, it's gone? <laughs> I started having a pity party with myself right there in B-22. An older gentleman across the aisle struck up a conversation with me. He said he was a minister. He lectured every day in a different city around the country. We talked for a few minutes, and then he asked me a question that changed my life. He said, young man, how old do you think I am? I looked him up and down. I said, sir, I think you're about 60. He smiled. He took off his glasses. He looked me dead in my eye. He said, young man, I'm 88 years old. I'm 88, and my best is yet to come. In that moment, everything shifted in my head because if an 88-year-old man could have the optimism to believe that his best days were in front of him and not behind him, what did I have to whine and cry and complain about? And I went home and I started living my dream. And in those 20 years since I met him, I've been inducted in the Speaker Hall of Fame, named one of the outstanding five speakers in the world, had best-selling books, started a new ministry called JollyGoodNews.org, where we're going to impact people in prisons and young people, because we believe that God is able to turn your setbacks into comebacks. And I came here today to the Crystal Cathedral to say to you without a question in my mind, your best is yet to come. Your best is yet to come. Your best is yet to come. So church, it's not what's going to happen in the future. It's who holds the future. I know I can go forward and you can go forward because our Savior still lives. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He led and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives.
lies Praise the Lord. What a terrific service. Thank you, Willie Jolly. What a terrific message. Oh, praise the Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, abide with you now till Jesus comes again in life or in death.